this is going to be a crazy video. So I came across this topic on a conspiracy theory video and one of the topics was an engine that apparently could run for 100,000 miles on one refuel. The engine itself ran on a mix of 17 ounces of deuterium and an ounce and a half of gallium. Now to make it more interesting, the inventor died while in good health in his 50s from a heart attack. So Chris of the future here, yeah? um, when editing this, I wanted to find some pictures of the dude and the engine and everything. Um, if you any of you guys got time, go and search up this dude and see if you can find like anything, like any pictures or anything. Because I can't, it's almost as if he never existed. I can't find a picture on Google, anyway. Um, I can't find a picture of the engine itself at all. So, yeah, that's why I don't have any pictures of him in this video. Or any pictures of the engine itself, because there isn't any. But yeah, let's get back into the video. Just thought I'd try to explain why there isn't any pictures, yeah. In this video, I want to dive deep into the creator of this motor, the motor itself, and how it should work, the specs of the motor, investments and suppression, and then I want to see if I can find any science that can back the technology. So let's start this all off. In the late 1970s, a brilliant inventor named Rory Johnson, hailing from Illinois, ignited a revolution that would reverberate across the realm of energy generation at a time when the world was tethered to fossil fuels and traditional energy sources. Johnson dared to envision a future powered by the marvels of his own creation. His brainchild, a magnetic motor driven by cold fusion, laser activation and a visionary propulsion method that defied the status quo. Now, when he started, nobody really believed in him. In fact, most thought that he was a little crazy, but this didn't stop him. He continued his research. You see, Johnson discovered the light activation cold fusion by accident while working on a new type of electronic circuit using deuterium oxide and gallium. Johnson noticed that the two materials were producing energy on their own and couldn't figure out what was causing it until he realized that it was light. And with this, he started working on his engine. Now, the name of the engine would be the Magnetron Engine. I will say that's a pretty dope name. Gives me Transformers vibes. And this is how it worked. You see, within the magnetron engine, the movement of deuterium was meticulously guided through magnetic conduits upon interaction with gallium, acting as a potent electron donor. A cascade of events is set in motion. A focused light beam emitted from a diffraction prism triggers the fusion process as deuterium and gallium combine. This orchestrated fusion of atomic components begets the birth of a fresh atom, ushering forth a torrent of electrical energy that powers the magnetic motor. While the magnetron remains hermetically sealed, the infusion of light materializes through photon energy harnessed from intricately linked coils. This orchestrated interplay essentially constitutes a pulsating energy generating system. Now the photon that is produced within the engine resembles a miniature football embodying a parcel of electromagnetic wave energy. Its potency is the culmination of its frequency intertwined with Planck's consistent. When an electron orbits an atom's nucleus and descends to a lower, less energetic trajectory, it dispenses a photon imbued with energy mirroring the electron's descent. This phenomenon accounts for the dual nature of light and other electromagnetic energies like gamma rays and radar now appearing as particles, then as waves. Still with me? Uh, I know, I, I lost myself too. So let me try and explain this a little better, and in simpler terms. You see, inside the magnetron there are two important things, deuterium and gallium. These are like the ingredients for making energy within the engine. When these two things come together, they usually make a special kind of reaction happen. But to start this reaction, we need something else, light. This is where the light activated part comes in. There's a special tool in the magnetron that shines a beam of light onto the deuterium and gallium. When this light touches them, they join together in a way that makes a new kind of energy. This new energy is what powers the engine. It is like when you put gas in a regular car and the car can move. But in the magnetron, it's a special reaction between deuterium, gallium and light that makes the engine go. Now remember, the magnetron is sealed up tight, so you can't just see the light. But the light is actually created by something called photon energy. This photon energy is like tiny invisible particles that carry the light. 
These particles are made inside the engine and they help make this reaction happen. So in simple terms, the magnetron uses deuterium, gallium and light to create a reaction that makes energy. This energy powers the engine and makes it run. So our guy Rory had his engine. Now he needed to file a patent. Well, that's where his first problem started. You see, the US Patent Office rejected the idea, arguing that they do not grant patents for perpetual motion machines and that Johnson's motor would never work. Again, it didn't stop and continued working. This engine would be a technological masterpiece. It harnessed the very essence of magneticism to produce an astounding 525 horsepower. It was a groundbreaking revelation poised to transform the way the world thought about energy efficiency, transportation and sustainability. Johnson's magnetic motors could propel a large truck or bus an astonishing 100,000 miles using just deuterium, gallium and light as a fuel. What Johnson achieved was years ahead of his contemporaries, preceding the emergence of cold fusion technologies from the likes of Pons Fleshmans and Dr. James Patterson. Intrigued by the promise of his invention, Greyhound Bus Company entered negotiations with Johnson, envisioning a fleet of buses powered by his revolutionary engine, and apparently one of the employees of the bus company actually saw the motor running. This delighted the company and the potential for monumental fuel savings, reduced maintenance costs and increased profits for Greyhound bus companies seemed tantalizingly within reach. However, unbeknownst to Johnson, his innovation had caught the attention of an unexpected adversary, OPEC. The oil giants keenly monitored any potential threat to their industry dominance, and Johnson's revolutionary technology marked him as their number one target. As Johnson embarked on his mission to revolutionize transportation and energy, his life took a series of bewildering twists. You see, there was a sudden silence from Johnson's end. Ground, the investing company, was baffled. Despite initial enthusiasm and discussions, no concrete business proposal was presented by Johnson for over two years. This delay raised questions and concerns. Then, Johnson's former business partner Mike Marzicola revealed that Johnson had passed away. Marzicola aimed to collaborate with Ground to revive the technology by reconnecting the generator wires that Johnson had previously and rather mysteriously cut. Now later in the video you'll understand why he cut it, but let's go on. I want to say though, everything from this point further is alleged, I don't want issues. So, a key twist in the story involves a government issued grab order, which gave the US government the authority to seize Johnson's motors. It's rumored that the Department of Energy, which some believed was influenced by US oil companies and OPEC, sought to prevent potential competition to their oil-related interests. Johnson's decision to cut the generator wires and move his entire operation to a different state under the cover of darkness was likely driven by the grab order. And when attempts were made to revive the technology by Johnson's business partners, Greyhound buses rejected the proposal to restart one of the motors. Despite potential fuel savings and other benefits to the bus company, Greyhound's top legal advisor revealed that the rejection was influenced by larger concerns. Apparently, a state representative had raised objections, suggesting that widespread use of Johnson's motor technology in Greyhound's fleet of over 4,000 buses could lead to substantial losses in tax revenue, mainly due to reduced fuel consumption. In essence, it appears that Johnson's innovative motor technology posed a threat to establish interests in the oil industry, prompting actions to suppress its development and deployment. The interplay of government authority, corporate interest and potential economic impacts contributed to the challenges Johnson's technology faced in gaining traction and recognition. Then for his death. The circumstances surrounding his demise were shrouded in mystery, given his robust health and relatively young age of a 50-year-old. Yet even in death, Johnson's legacy continued to confound as his laboratory in Illinois was abandoned overnight. All his motors and technology vanished to California. Now, when making this video, I went really deep down the rabbit hole and I read some crazy shit. For instance, Bob Bass, in his report on low-energy nuclear transportation, claimed that the CIA, the KGB, and the Mossad all had sprays, which can be sprayed upon someone and cause him or her to die of an apparent natural cause. One speculation is that Johnson's death had been artificially induced by such a spray. Now, I will say that this is a little tinfoily for me, 
But I do agree that it is suspicious that he died while his stuff was being suppressed by the government and oil companies. Anyways, further unraveling the saga, it came to light that the US Department of Energy had imposed a restraining order on Johnson's company, Magnetron Incorporated, a puzzling impediment to the production of the very innovation poised to reshape energy dynamics. By the way, let me show you something crazy. This is an extract from a newsletter called Fusion Facts. Now, this letter aimed to report on the latest news and info on cold fusion and other forms of energy. This specific issue is from August 1993. Now, on page 14, they have a piece on the magnetron engine, which goes through some of the stuff we talk about today. But here is the weird thing. On page 17, there is an editor's note, which I will put on screen now. As part of his due diligence, Orlovsky has researched the patent literature for magnetically driven devices, and here is a copy of his findings. Now I actually took the time and went through some of the patent numbers, and I searched them on the patent database. Now all of them I found with the correct patent owner, except for number 4100431, filed by Johnson on the fourth month of the year in 1979. Now according to this letter, it should be the magnetron motor. But when you search it, it's a power supply system for an old phone. So is there a mistake in this old newsletter? Or was his patent removed? Before I go on, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. And in this video, we will talk about the other side of the story. But I will say, when researching this dude, there is little to no info, no pictures. It really seems as if he never even existed. If it wasn't for the news articles that I found, I would think all of this was just made up. By the way, my head hurts. I, I read way too much and did way too much research on this. Um, but let's carry on. I want to tell the other side of the story. Then you can decide for yourself what happened to the technology. You see, when researching this, most info just tells you the conspiracy theory side of all of this. And I wanted to see if there was anything more to it. And I did find quite a lot, including a news excerpt from a 1980s news article, which shines a bit more light on the restraining order, the lawsuits against Johnson and his engine. P.S. Um, I did spend way too much time researching this and finding more info than just the conspiracy theories and stuff. But if you guys enjoyed this video, please leave a like and subscribe and then I'll make more videos like this in the future. Yeah, but let's get into the lawsuit and fraud charges against him. The Illinois Attorney General's office initiated a subpoena enforcement lawsuit against Johnson and Magnetron. The lawsuit included two counts of fraud. These charges were in response to Johnson's actions related to the promotion and representation of his engine technology. The sequence of events leading to the lawsuit began with Johnson anonymously leaking news about his engine in 1977. In 1978, he started promoting it publicly. Johnson attracted investors, convincing them to invest $25,000 each in his venture. When the Attorney General Office became aware of the investments, and claims surrounding the engine, they requested documentation from Johnson to substantiate his assertions. However, Johnson refused to provide the requested documents. In June of 1978, a temporary restraining order was issued against Johnson as he continued to resist providing evidence to back his claims. The Attorney General's office obtained a permanent injunction. This injunction prohibited Johnson from promoting the engine and selling investments to the general public. However, he was still permitted to seek investors from the commercial segment. Johnson appealed the injunction, taking the case all the way to the Illinois Supreme Court. Despite his efforts, the injunction was upheld by the court. Now, this lawsuit included two counts of fraud. One count pertained to Johnson's misrepresentation of his personal achievements and technical capabilities. For instance, he claimed to have graduated from prestigious institutions like MIT and Darmstadt, which were denied by the institutions themselves, claiming that he never even attended. He also misrepresented his work experience at companies like Westinghouse, NASA, and Motorola. The second kind of fraud was related to Johnson's misrepresentation of the engine itself. He consistently refused to produce the necessary documentation to substantiate his claims about the engine's capabilities. There were instances of cancelled demonstrations with the Department of Energy and others, preventing a proper showcase of the engine's functionality. Then after all of the missed demonstrations and refusal of documentations, the Illinois Attorney General's office had an affidavit from Dr. Charles Baker, who was the head of the Fusion 
Power Program at the Ergon National Laboratory in Illinois. And Dr. Baker's affidavit stated that the fusion reaction described by Johnson was scientifically impossible. So at the end of the video, I want to know what you think. Was Johnson a genius inventor that got suppressed by the government and oil giants? Or was he a genius corn man who fooled thousands? By the way, while researching this engine, I found more engines and technologies like this that was allegedly suppressed. If you want more videos like this, let me know down below and then I can make some more videos. They do take a while, so the next one won't be out like next week. These videos take a bit longer than my average video because there's a lot more that goes into them. But yeah, if you guys like this video, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. And if you did like it, you must probably like most of my other stuff. So just go through my channel, see if there's something else you like. I'll check you guys in the next one. Cheers, I.